Hello, everybody. Welcome to the third public forum of Action Track to shift to healthy and sustainable consumption patterns of the UN Food Systems Summit. Uh, lots of people have joining in, and that's great news. People are coming in from all over. I would request participants to introduce themselves in the chat and let us know where you're joining in from so we know each other well. We are on Facebook Live on Food Systems Summit Facebook page. I would also urge you to check out the house rules in the chat box because they tell us how to go forward and it will help us resolve issues. And we would also request you to put your questions in the Q&A. We aim to answer all your questions in the Q&A and please do not put them in the chat. So there are different functions here. We have a wonderful team that is helping us and we'll try all your questions and many of them will be answering them live. <clears throat> Also, we request you to use the hashtag, hashtag UNFSS2021. And please amplify this in the social media because we need to reach out to people. This is a people summit and it's the people's message. It's the people's ideas, which we are collecting and we are going to be synthesizing in the Food Systems Summit. The webinar is available in English, Spanish and French. The instructions have been posted in the chat. If you just follow them, you will be able to reach different and get different languages. I'm Ajay Jakhand, Vice Chair of Action Track 2 and a farmer by profession. I will be moderating this 90 minute session where many presenters will be explaining the work that is happening in Action Track 2. It's really exciting and we wanna share this with you. So before we go ahead, I would request our leader, Action Track 2 Chair, Gunhail Stoughton, to give us an absolutely exciting start to a session. Gunhail, this is, uh, please come in here. Hi, hi, and welcome. Welcome to the Open Forum and welcome to my kitchen here in Oslo, Norway. So the big goal for 2021 for East and myself is obviously to get the world to eat more healthy and sustainable. But I have to tell you something uh, which is a bit embarrassing. Uh, but although I'm working with food from morning to night, I still hardly find my way around the kitchen. So I will now use the summit process as an excuse to learn how to cook. So uh, I'm going to share on social media, uh, but uh, today I'm going to have some friends over uh, with Wood from Pakistan and Thailand. So today we are going to uh, make some a vegetarian uh, Thai curry. We are going to make some uh, sag paneer, some spinach with some Indian cheese. And then we are going to have some, uh, some uh, Norwegian trout. So before I start cooking, I just want to say that it's not only into my kitchen you are being invited. You, people from all over who are interested, will actually be invited into the kitchen for the summit process itself, which is actually quite unique because normally for a big summit like this, people or the public is normally invited to the table after the menu has been decided, cooked and served and people are invited to then watch the results from a distance. But this summit is actually quite unique. Now, all of you are being invited, not only to join the table, but actually to join the cooking itself, to help decide on the ingredients, decide on the menu, and actually take part in the preparations. And what are we talking about? Of course, the menu of game-changing solutions propositions. So thanks again for being here. Across the five action tracks, we have now received more than a thousand ideas for game-changing solutions from all around the world. And this is only the first wave. Today, you will get some of these solutions propositions that we have received through action track two. Uh, you will get them presented. So please use the chat. Please use the Q&A function. Tell us what you think. How can we improve these propositions? And last open forum we held in late February, we got more than 200 questions from the people who attended at that time. Let's aim for even more today. It's not only comments and questions on the propositions that we already have received that we would like, we would also like you to submit new ideas for game-changing solutions. Because we know that there are important gaps, for example, around blue food, seafood, marketing uh, or incentives for business. And what will happen when the menu of solutions are ready on the table? Well, then we will come back and ask your help again to build stakeholder commitments from governments, from business and others. 
and also to turn these great solutions, in theory, uh, into game-changing actions on the ground through building strong action coalitions. I always say that nobody can do everything, but everybody can do something. And this is so true when it comes to food. Because the only way we can succeed in transforming our food system, fix the broken food system, is by working together. And we need all of you. All of us have to come together for our health, for our common future. So if we do this shift, if we succeed in fixing food by 2030, we can not only help tackle climate change and protect our planet, but we can save at least 11 million lives every year and improve the health and well-being of 100 million more. And it's so many co-benefits. We can build a greater future, the future we want. In fact, our only chance is doing it together. But that is also why I remain such a hardcore optimist. Because food is such a massive, powerful connector. Food connects people. It connects people around the table, but across border, across cultures, across religions, across sectors and disciplines. Food connects us all. It's perhaps the common denominator across the world that brings us all together. And at the end of the day, we are all stakeholders of the global food system because we all have to eat. We all have to eat and we all have a voice. We all have a role to play in fixing food. Okay guys, the forum needs to get going and I need to get uh, going with the cooking. If you want to see how it goes, feel free to follow me on Instagram. But more importantly, play your role, play your part and have your voice heard. And thanks again for being here. Thank you. Thank you so much. You really energized us and you are an optimist as, a, as an optimist can be. And thank you so much for your inspiring conversation. It's very clear that food connects us and we need to connect food to policy, to private sector, to youth, to civil society, to health of not only the planet, of the people, and to, to get everyone together, like you said, share it together and get positive changes, make positive changes possible. In this uh, one and a half hour event, we'll be taking, there will be doing four polls to get your opinion and also to share the results with you. These polls are anonymous. I will uh, request for the first poll to uh, come on. And uh, can we share the first poll on the screen now? The, yes, the first poll is that which stakeholder group do you think has the most influence in action track to? The choices are there before you, farmers, civil society, private sector business, indigenous people, government, cities, youth, consumers, and others. Please uh, take time to submit your replies as we go ahead. We, are, we have a very, very tight schedule. I will first introduce the wonderful panelists from all over the world, all over the planet that we have. First and foremost, we have uh, France's ambassador and permanent representative to Rome-based agencies, Celine uh, Yogerson, uh, Yogerson. Second, we have Khalifa Mualusi, project manager of nutrition at AUDA, Nepal. Third, we have Victor Mugo, co-chair, Youth Lysen Group of UN Food System Summit, and Emily Hengen, uh, Hennig Hen. Sun Business Network Coordinator, and Yon, Chief of Indigenous People Unit, FOA. And lastly, Helena Wright, Policy Director at FAIRR Initiative. Now, this is a lightning round where every participant gets to speak for two minutes or less. So I'll request uh, Celine to come in first. Uh, please, Celine, the floor is yours. Merci beaucoup. Bonjour à tous. Et euh, je suis ravie d'être dans ce forum avec vous. Merci Ajay et merci Gunhild. Nous entrons dans une phase très importante pour le sommet, comme l'a souligné Gunhild, avec la sélection des solutions pour le sommet. Et je me réjouis de participer aux discussions aujourd'hui. La France est très engagée en faveur du succès du sommet et à présenter ses priorités et ses solutions pour le sommet. Je souhaiterais parler aujourd'hui d'une solution en particulier qui nous semble extrêmement importante. C'est la question de l'alimentation scolaire. 
une coalition de plusieurs États membres, d'organisations, notamment le Programme alimentaire mondial, est en cours de formation pour faire de l'alimentation scolaire une des solutions majeures de ce sommet. Nous pensons en effet que les programmes d'alimentation scolaire sont un enjeu crucial permettant de répondre à de nombreux objectifs du développement durable et à ce titre, ils doivent faire partie de notre point de vue euh, des résultats majeurs du sommet. Nous l'avons présenté comme Game Changing Solution. Nous nous réunissons avec plusieurs États membres et organisations pour pousser cette question. Nous nous félicitons que le PAM soit très engagé en faveur de ces programmes d'alimentation scolaire. Le président de la République française, Emmanuel Macron, a soutenu la priorité accordée à ces programmes et la coalition qui est euh, annoncée par le programme alimentaire mondial, nous avons déjà annoncé un financement pour ce sujet. Et donc, j'invite tous les pays, toutes les délégations et les organisations à nous rejoindre dans la mobilisation pour faire de l'alimentation scolaire une des solutions concrètes majeures de ce sommet. Merci à tous et bonne discussion. Thank you, Celine. I think uh, even the UN Food System Summit is committed to school meals. And thank you so much, not only to you personally, but also to France for being, taking such an active interest in, in the system summit. Uh, we move on to uh, Kefliva. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, moderator AJ. Uh, good afternoon. Good morning, colleagues. Um, I'm Kifilo Malusi, calling from uh, the African Union Development Agency, known as NEPAT. I'm based in uh, Johannesburg, South Africa. We are supporting the facilitation of the African Union member states, all the 54 member states. Our role is to facilitate and coordinate all the national uh, food systems dialogues. And our role as ADN and NEPAD is to ensure that Africa is not left behind. So far, we are pushing for all the EU member states to nominate the government uh, conveners. To date, we have about 27 national conveners coming from uh, Africa and being the leading continent globally when it comes to nominating national um, conveners. So for the past uh, weeks and months, we've been uh, you know, convening what is called the uh, orientation for all the AU member states focusing on agriculture and nutrition, including the scaling of nutrition for Calpens to ensure that they form a, you know, a part of the dialogues at national level, there's steady discussions of these dialogues. From our side, we believe that Home growth school feeding program is one of the game changer solutions for also action track two. As the previous speaker had mentioned, Madam Celine, we do believe in school feeding program. We have been supporting a lot of member states when it comes to home growth school feeding by linking the smallholder farmers to the schools, by therefore also creating wealth because we're creating market for the smallholder farmers. At the same time, ensuring that our school children receive nutritious meals and keeping our girl child, in particular in some parts of Africa, we do have a lot of child marriage. We want to keep our girl child, of course, not forgetting the boy child to ensure that they benefit from the school feeding program. From the comprehensive uh, agriculture program called CADAP, it's been there since 2003. We have been leverage, leveraging this program to ensure that it's connected to the United Nations Food Systems Summit. And in Africa, all the AU member states have, you know, uh, uh, established what is called the CADAP national teams that are multi-sectoral, involving uh, all the key sectors from, from education to agriculture, to health, to social protection, to finance, because at the end of the day, we need to promote investments in Africa. And under the CADAP framework, we do nudge all the heads of states to allocate 10% of national budget and it also to allocate 6% increase when it comes to agriculture production and productivity in Africa. And therefore, as AU, we believe that uh, in terms of supporting the Food System Summit, we have existing framework, which is CADAP, that we can leverage the implementation of UN 
food system summit uh, going going forward and making school feeding as the game changer of the food system summit for action track two thank you for the opportunity over thank, thank you aj thank you so much as a farmer i love it when you say about homegrown food and linking it to you know to health and linking a systems approach i request participants to limit themselves to two minutes uh, we come next to victor mugo please uh, victor the floor is yours Thank you so much. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever you are listening in from. And I'm very glad to be here. My name is Victor Mugo. I am a young farmer. I also work with young people to transition them into uh, climate uh, resilient agriculture, as well as into agri-food entrepreneurship. Uh, unfortunately, I am also the co-chair of, of the UN Food Systems um, Summit Youth Liaisons Group. And, and I'm really glad to, to, to be speaking here. Um, so we have seen that uh, in this uh, action track uh, on uh, sustainable uh, changing to sustainable food patterns um, that we can be able to leverage on young people because they are the greatest uh, consumption uh, uh, group that we have. And so if this transformation that is going to be coming uh, out of uh, the game changing solutions, out of the food system summit, we really should rely on the young people. Uh, and in that regard, then we should really um, be able to meaningfully involve them and also uh, to actively uh, help them to participate in this process. Uh, we've seen that this action track and the Food System Summit has really been uh, pertinent in this in doing so. And we've seen uh, Food Systems Champions Network having youth representatives. We've seen action track vice chairs uh, in action tracks, even such as this. Um, we've also seen young people organizing independent dialogues uh, in an ambitious process uh, to ensure that they their voices and opinions are heard. We have the Youth Liaisons Group, which uh, is trying to reach the most unreached uh, and young people from across uh, the food systems uh, uh, areas where uh, that can, have not been yet reached. And we have game changing solutions and ideas uh, by young people, but also uh, game changing solutions that are youth oriented. And, and we really like that in all the interaction within the food system summit, young uh, youth empowerment ha has been uh, identified as a common uh, theme you. across the four levels of change. And so we really look forward to participating and going forward uh, into this discussion. Victor, thank you so much. We have a youth vice chair, Lana. She's fantastic. She's she's involved and she's getting youth from across the planet to join in. And not only this track and other tracks, we'll move on to Emily. Uh, Emily, please. Hi, everyone. Thanks. Uh, oh. Thanks so much for having me here. Um, my name is Emily Hennigan. I work with the Sun, Sun Business Network. That is the Scaling Up Nutrition Business Network. We work across more than 30 countries to support business, specifically small and medium enterprises, to, to contribute more constructively to national nutrition agendas. So I wanted to talk a little bit today about the role of, of, media, of micro, small and medium enterprises within the summit, given that we know how the key role that business is playing within, our, within the world's food systems. Not only is the private sector involved at every step of the food value chain, and most people around the world access their food through stores, markets, et cetera, operated by businesses and entrepreneurs. Now, the role of MSMEs in food systems in low and middle income countries is especially important. Uh, I live in Zambia. In Afri across Africa and Asia, for example, MSMEs dominate 50 to 80% of food economies. Now, within the summit, there are a number of platforms that are really exciting for engaging, engaging business. For multinational companies, we have platforms that include CEO panels and business consultations, but we also have see a strong, a strong push coming from MSMEs elevating their voices through the action tracks, including participation, our, our, our own network participation in several action tracks and an MSME pitch competition organized through action track one. But we, we really feel that the key opportunity for MSMEs in the FSS processes is through the regional and national food systems dialogues, because we need to hear and understand firsthand the perspective, perspectives and constraints faced by MSMEs in the context where they operate, as well as the opportunities for growth and innovation that they've identified. And we believe that this is especially important for successful implementation of game changing solutions across low and middle income countries where the role is crit where MSME role is absolutely critical in transforming food systems to make healthier, more affordable and sustainable diets, both available and, to and desirable to all people. Thank you again for having me here and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you.
Uh, so, sorry, they got muted somehow. Uh, we, we'll just move on to the next. We'll move on to Yon. And Emily, I just want to say, yes, uh, uh, MSMEs can also come in through independent dialogues that we have, other than the national dialogues which are taking place. Thank you. So Yon, it's over to you. Thank you, Ajay. Thank you, colleagues. It's a pleasure to be here. Imagine if the third largest country in the world will have unique food systems capable of generating food, but also preserving 80% of the remaining biodiversity. Imagine the third largest, most populous country in the world, where culture is so important that 4,000 out of the 6,000 remaining languages are spoken. Imagine 476 million people practicing circular economy based on reciprocity, solidarity, and mutual support. Imagine hundreds of territorial management systems that have been time tested generation after generation and have prevailed through catastrophes and changes in society. There are 476 million indigenous peoples living in 90 countries in seven sociocultural regions who have developed unique indigenous people's food systems. Food systems that are adapted to different ecosystems and climatic areas, yet provide food to indigenous communities in a sustainable and resilient way. There is a unique opportunity for Action Track 2 to consider two game changers proposed by indigenous peoples. The first one considering indigenous people's food systems as game changer in itself that combines territorial management, nutrition, food security, traditional knowledge, and biodiversity protection. And the second one to come up with models of interculturality in policy making, schooling, education, school feeding that includes indigenous language, but also the knowledge about foods and edibles that they have accumulated for hundreds of years. FAO and the Global Hub supports these two game changers. The time is now. The world will not understand a food summit about sustainability and resilience without indigenous peoples at the center. I uh, thank you so much. That's so powerful and that's so true. I think indigenous people are there. And not only that, as a farmer, I can tell you, I think they are the ones who keep the biodiversity of the planet. They are the ones who are the keepers of biodiversity of the planet. And definitely it's, it's at the heart of the food systems summit. And we will move on to Helena. Helena Wright, uh, I hope, yes. Hello, um, great to Hello. be here today. Hi, I'm the um, Director of Policy at FAIR, which is an investor network focused on sustainable food systems. And we actually have invested members of more than 30 trillion in, in collective assets supporting the network, um, which is focused on basically research on ESG risks amongst the largest protein producers. And I just wanted to share some of our research that links to the Food Systems Summit and how we can support with game changing solutions. Um, firstly, on the risks, we found that 86% of major meat and dairy companies are failing to disclose their emissions. And over 70% of animal agricultural companies are actually at high risk of fostering new pandemics. So that outlines some of the risks that we're facing here in the global food system. But actually, I wanted to mention uh, protein diversification, which is already becoming um, a major and significant way to reduce climate, climate risk, as well as responding to shifting consumer demand. So there is rising demand for meat alternative products. It currently represents a small proportion of the current protein market, but is projected to take a significant and rising chunk of the total protein market in the coming years. Um, so this links to the uh, just transition solution, which I believe some of the other speakers are going to touch on. Livestock producers really risk becoming a stranded asset. So there's really a need for more proactive support to actually help farmers in the livestock sector transition away from meat and dairy and into more sustainable production systems. And also when it comes to subsidy reform, I'd like to quickly draw your attention to a recent investor statement, which actually called on uh, the European Commission to be more ambitious in their planned reform of the common agricultural policy. And that statement actually called for reducing of support to commodities with high emissions, such as red meat and dairy, and actually applying a just transition mechanism to support farmers in a transition to a more sustainable agriculture system. And I'd like to raise the opportunities that this uh, draws for job creation and for quality, um, sustainable jobs. Actually, there was a report, interestingly, by the International Labour Organization in Latin America, which found that the shift to plant based foods could create millions of new and additional jobs in the agri food sector. So I'd just like to end with that positive note that this is an opportunity for transition 
to a more sustainable food system. Thanks very much. It seems you're part of action track two and we will move on. We'll be coming to just transitions again, just soon. Thank you for sharing your ideas for solutions. We've received over 400 ideas, you know, it's, it just goes on and on and we're waiting for this. It's these ideas which drive the food systems and they are all available on the community platform. Please will visit the summits community platform to read action track two wave one solution synthesis reports. And you will be offered to provide feedback on the solutions through the platform. You may also read solutions of other action tracks which with who we continuously integrate in the weeks ahead. You will also have, you still have a chance to submit your ideas for wave two using the online form, which is available till 1st of May, which is still 10 days away. And it's also being posted on the chat. So please look that up. The results of poll one are now gonna be put up on the, on the screen. Yes, there they are. So the poll one results talk about, uh, if you look at it, oh, that, that's gone from the screen, but consumers, uh, yes, can we have them again? That's right. So the, it continuously changes on its own. Uh, maximum we go to is to consumers, 25% will influence, then governments will influence and the private sector will influence. The head and head, all three of them. But together, no one section of society or stakeholders can make a difference. I think it will be all together. So we move on and we will show the second poll now. Uh, before before we go on, the second poll is on just rural transitions. How how game changing is this solution? You you'll be you are asked to rate it from one to five. While that happens, we will move on. We are running already late with the uh, with the program. Now this rural transitions is going to be explained by Lasse, who's the civil society lead for Action Track Two and lies into Action Track Four. He's the executive director of 50 by 40, a very knowledgeable person in the thicket of it all. And this is an idea which is catching on. So Lasse, please, can I ask you to uh, come here now? Thank you. Yes, of course. Thank you for having me here today and thanks for all the great contributions so far. So I will be speaking a bit to the rural just transition, which uh, Helena particularly also spoke a bit to now. So thanks for making that plug in there. Helen, I appreciate that. Um, so as the headline says here, we want to enable a just transition of livestock to mitigate climate change, improve health and create jobs. And that's the main intersectionality we think is very crucial for this solution. Um, so I'll be speaking about this very briefly. So my name is Les Bourne. I'm the CEO of 50 by 40, which is a collective impact organization. And I'm also the global civil society lead for Action Track 2 and the liaison between Action Track 2 and five. So I'll start with this statement here. A just trans transformation of livestock production is not only instrumental to solving climate crisis, but also brings numerous environmental health and socioeconomic benefits. So what are those? Well, the most important ones I would like to just point out here. First of all, of course, the climate emergency, the global livestock production accounts for at least 14.5%. And as uh, Helena mentioned before, it is likely to be much higher. Uh, environmental degradation, that's not just in, in relation to uh, deforestation, for growing feed, or for grazing. It is also for local environments, local water and air pollution, uh, which is alongside the uh, animal agriculture plants. Antimicrobial resistance is an in increasing uh, big problem. Um, which means that often people, when they need to take antibiotics, actually has developed a resistance because they've been so subjected to them through the way they eat. Infectious diseases, well, we are still very much in the COVID-19 crisis right now. And there is, a, unfortunately, the, uh, established a clear link between large-scale animal agriculture operations and um, infectious diseases. And chronic and non-communicable diseases, well, type 2 diabetes um, um, and cardiovascular diseases in particular are very strongly linked to the overconsumption of animal products, particularly the red meat. And most importantly, also, this, it addresses the unjust global nutrition distribution. Um, we do not have a food production problem in the world, if you ask me. We have a food distribution problem because we're producing way too much food in some places and wasting it and making people obese. In other places, people are 
undernourished and suffering from nutrition deficiency. And this issue definitely also addresses that in terms of freeing up more land to grow food directly for human consumption instead of overconsumption of animal products. So how does this solution address the problem? Well, one thing is to, I mentioned already, address the, the environmental degradation, and that's particularly linked to the, um, to the grazing of cattle and also for the production of, uh, of feed, soy and corn, particularly particular in the Americas, or palm kernel expeller in Indonesia to feed livestock, and also the local environmental issues as mentioned before. It's also about saving lots of money in, on health costs. In average, 8 million lives are, could be saved by 2050 by shifting to diets that are less reliant on meat and more reliant on food and vegetables. And you can see the, the references are in the corner here, but I'll also, of course, share the presentation after if you want to dig more into those numbers. And also, it's about improving the socioeconomics of the farming system. Helena touched on that before. There is a direct link on the shifting towards a more plant-based food system and creating jobs and revitalizing rural economies. And again, mentioning the ILO study from last year that actually found that, it would, that shifting to more plant-based diet in Latin America and the Caribbean would actually create up to 15 million jobs net by 2030, coinciding, by, so coinciding with the uh, Sustainable Development Goals. So how does this solution specifically address the problem? Well, equitable food distribution is key, as I mentioned before, but also protecting livelihoods. We're talking about industrialized large-scale productions in the global north, particularly, um, which also is a problem because they are outcompeting the small-scale farmers in the global south, uh, particularly pastoralist and uh, indigenous peoples. Um, so therefore, the onus is on the G20 countries to lead the transition. It is a bit like the comment about differentiated responsibility you find within the UNFCCC. Those who are creating the problems are traditionally has created pro the problems are the ones who should be dealing with the issue first. We should also be looking into preventing livestock intensification in the global south. Um, there is, as you know, lots of land grabbing taking place, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa. And this is something that needs to be addressed as well. And it, does, it, it is unfortunately not um, contributing much to, to nutrition deficiency in countries. Rather, it is in some ways, and I don't say this lightly, often a form of neocolonialism. Um, so to take it forward, we need to develop a set of uh, global multidisciplinary policy measures, which means that we have to work across disciplines. For this specifically, the ministers of agriculture, the ministers of climate change, the ministers of health and the ministers of finance will have to work strongly together. To do that and to come up with concrete solution for what it might look like, we need to develop country specific transition roadmaps that outlines very clearly what are the key steps we need to take moving forward by when and by whom. And finally, we can I'll be remiss not to mention the importance of coupling this with other international fora, particularly the UNFCCC and particularly COP26 that takes place at the end of this year as well. You will know that the NDC revisions, the natural con, um, uh, determined contributions are essentially the country's climate change maps uh, um, are, are crucial for how we deal with climate change. And up until now, there has been very little focus on the livestock aspects there. It has been focusing a lot on energy, transportation and industry. So I think we have a chance now to really maximize the Paris Agreement framework that lays out that every five years uh, after the Paris Agreement was signed in 2015, the countries that are part of the UNFCCC has to come together and say, this is what we have done as our contribution to address the issue of climate change. This is what we are doing right now. And we have a great chance now to ensure that the next time this is gonna be um, addressed at the UNFCCC in 2025, that livestock production as it as relates to agriculture and all the issues I've just mentioned is going to be front and center. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Lasse. Thank you for that. I will, uh, I mean, this, this, is, this is a solution that is catching on, like I said, like wildfire across the planet. And I leave it to Victor and Helena to come in on this. I request Victor to stop and please limit yourself to two minutes. We are running late. And I also, uh, before Victor comes in, just, just a second, I would request all, all the participants to post your questions in the Q&A. We are trying to answer all of them. We'll also be taking some of them live. Please, uh, Victor, the, the floor is yours. 
Uh, okay, absolutely great. And thanks so much for this opportunity. Um, and so just to build a case for a just transition, uh, I will just paint a small picture. Uh, I live in Kenya, a country that is in the global south and not far away from where I live uh, is the Maasai community, which is a traditional uh, um, community whose uh, traditional way of life is centered around livestock. Uh, and so for 500 years, their community has depended on cattle really to provide everything for them, uh, food, uh, clothing, shelter, um, and they do not even have, or they do not even own money. Uh, the economy is based on cattle, so they trade uh, cattle with other uh, 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 products and, and services. Uh, and so we see that livestock really plays an important uh, economic and social cultural role in, in where they live. However, and, and this is where the real point is, uh, these cattle really have do not meet the minimum market weight, uh, are vulnerable to diseases uh, and drought, uh, they lead to soil degrade, degradation, uh, biodiversity loss, uh, groundwater contamination, reduced soil fertility, uh, and a risk uh, really to um uh, our, our health uh because uh, even in the global south uh, the meat consumption is really on the rise uh, and so what we have seen uh, as a solution and people are really talking about it uh, is intensification which we do not think uh is uh is is the solution um we find that the livestock uh, problem is a consumption problem and which should have a consumption uh, solution to it uh if there's anything that we've learned from high income countries is that uh, intensification really leads to the detriment of, of our planet our ecosystems our resources our human health uh, and animal welfare and so uh, the livestock really uh, should be dealt uh, from a consumption point of view. And so we really like uh, this idea as young people, and we hope that uh, we can rely on the largest consumer group really to shift uh, to sustainable consumption patterns. Uh, so a transition is necessary, a uh, transition is imperative, uh, but most importantly, uh, this transition should be just. Thank you, Victor. Which, which we, what you're clearly saying is what Lasse said is that one shoe can't fit all policy will not work for the planet. Now we move on to Helena, please. Helena? Yeah. yeah, I'd also like to just um, mention some linked points which are connected to the just transition, um, namely that I think it's already been mentioned that um, basically there's also a huge benefit to food security to going to more sustainable consumption. And namely, at the moment, we're seeing a huge volume of uh, soya, maize and other crops that could be consumed by humans. Instead, they're going direct to animals. This is a really inefficient way to produce protein. Um, and that's already kind of well reported in the scientific literature. So what um, Victor is saying is absolutely apt. So intensification of livestock systems is not the way forward because that will use up more consumption of soya feed, of maize crops. Um, in fact, if we shift to more sustainable protein consumption globally, that could be a huge benefit to global food security, as well as the, all the other benefits like for livelihoods, for climate, for biodiversity, for health, for reducing pandemic risk, for reducing antibiotic resistance, just to name a number of the, the topics that FAIR works on. So I think there's all these associated benefits with a sustainable consumption transition. And I just want to touch on one point that was mentioned in the chat box there. Somebody pointed out that monocultures are responsible for herbicide use. I'd like to point out that um, the production of animal feed is a major source of herbicide um, and pesticide usage. And some of the scientific research has shown that the huge volumes of herbicides and pe pesticides primarily are used for animal feed crops. Um, so that's also another sustainability issue I'd just like to mention there. Thanks. Helena, I love your passion for the subject. I'll ask Lassa to respond. Lassa, you have three minutes. Thank you so much. Well, actually, this is going to be an easy feed. I, I had expected there would be a bit more pushback. So I was, you know, armed to the teeth to talk about this. But um, it seems that there is some, some consistency in terms of um, opinions around this issue. And I'm glad that it, it's uh, finally out there because it has been an issue that has been uh, neglected for quite some time. I remember in 2009 when I was at COP15 in Copenhagen, uh, specifically speaking about this, where at best I was a laughing stock. Uh, now, uh, so many years later, things have has um, unfortunately changed for the better. So now there's a more um, 
serious conversation around this, and I really appreciate the opportunity to speak today. Just specifically to what Victor and Helena were saying, Victor, I couldn't agree more, and also just want to emphasize very strongly, we are not talking about the uh, small scale production that pastoralists and indigenous people, and particularly the Maasai, are dealing with. Um, we are talking about the global north, and unfortunately also the increasingly global south, livestock, large-scale production, the so-called CAFOs. And um, particularly countries like Mozambique, you're seeing how people uh, in communities have been living uh, uh, in, in great symbiosis with nature and have living prosperous, nice lives. And then uh, new uh, operations are set up that kind of drives the local farmers out of market, out of the market because they are undercutting the prices of what the local livestock producers, for instance, can can put forward, which means which forces these farmers to either drop their business altogether or start working for that new big uh, operation that is there, uh, which is very unfortunate for all the obvious reasons. And to what you said, Helena, about the, the food security aspect, I couldn't agree more. And I would even take it a step further and, and speak to nutrition security, uh, because when we talk about food security, it is... Um, it is so important, but often it misses the, the, the uh, aspect of the, the diversity in the diet. And as we know, the, the single-sided aspects of a high animal protein diet are quite detrimental to, to health, whereas a plant-based diet often wise is much more diverse. So there's an aspect of nutrition as well. And also just to your point on the animal feed, um, I personally lived for many years in Brazil and I saw firsthand how the big soy fields are actually incredible sad monocultures that are, that are destroying local livelihoods and local uh, biohabitats. Um, and most people know of the Amazon, of course, but also the biomes known as the Cejado and the Kachinga are particularly also vulnerable to, to this kind of production system. So there is a specific direct linkage between overconsumption of animal proteins in the global north and the deforestation and natural uh, habitat destruction problems we're facing. I'll leave it there. Thank you. So uh, we'll just straight come to the Q&A. And I said the first question is uh, for you from Annie. Um, sorry, the first question is from Isabel. Uh, Baltenweg. And so I'll just read the question out. There is lots of solid research on sustainable livestock intensification, sustainability along with environment, social and economic domains. It would be fair in such discussions to refer to that body of evidence, especially for the low medium income countries. Can you share your thoughts on this? And, and let's try and keep it short because we're running late, please. Sure, I'll be brief. Um, sustainable intensification has been put forward as, as a solution. I personally do not subscribe to that. I think it is again trying to, to stay with the consumption patterns that is uh, wrongly put forward as a, a way people should be eating. I think it is better to have a much more um, uh, moderated diet that uh, takes into a question the, uh, the detrimental aspects of high animal protein consumption. So we don't need to produce more food. We don't need to clean up the existing food, uh, animal protein systems. We need to cut down on the production. That would be my reply. But of course, I recognize okay. it's out there and I'm open for discussion subsequently. So we'll move on to the next question. And I would want to assure Anne, who's posted in the chat, that yes, we are looking at common goals of sustainable diets across action track two and three together. So don't worry about it. We, we are working all together. So now the next question is from Anne Beatrice Kihara. Uh, we need to factor gender inclusivity and especially women empowerment in rural transition, food security, social, economic, and to give the additional fit for healthier mothers, children, and communities. Uh, in the low, low medium income countries to focus has been on patriarchally based. We would love to hear your thoughts on this. I couldn't agree more. If you look at particularly low income countries, the vast majority of, of farm, small scale farmers are indeed women and we need to do a much better job and not just protecting them, but actually uh, upping the game for them. So, so they are more empowered to, to, to move away from only being uh, workers, which often unfortunately is the case now, to take in much more charge of their productions from a food sovereignty perspective. And also there is a direct link between the establishment of large animal agriculture facilities and the uh, the deployment the the destruction of lo local livelihoods which would affect women as well so 
we would really have to focus much more on the aspects of of a revitalization of the rural economy, which could the, this transition we're talking about could could uh, dis very much benefit. And at the same time, talking about how we can empower women much more in the rural economies. Uh, you think, Victor and Helena, would you have a reflection on this if you want to come, come on this? I, I wanted to raise um, the idea is, of- we're running short of time. Great, just one quick point, which is the idea of more collaboration between the public and private sector in investments in blended finance, which could really support this uh, just transition solution. And I think more financial mechanisms, we could see some of the major development banks and others um, investing in new solutions for supporting sustainable agricultural systems. Um, that could be really transformational. Thank you. So, We'll, we'll move on. Uh, Victor, yes. Uh, I, I saw a question in the chat that asked, uh, so what is the solution for pastoralists? Uh, and I really like this game changing solution because it doesn't look at that. It looks at the biggest producers uh, of, of, of these livestock products and, and then looks at a way in which we can be able to reduce their consumption uh, for, uh, for, for these uh, meat products. And so I, I really like that it doesn't focus on <clears throat> the small communities and indigenous people who their lives are dependent on this, but looks at the major producers who, uh, of course, have a major contribution towards uh, their detriment. Thank you. Thank you to all three of you. Thank you so much. Can we have the results of poll two? Can we have them out now? It's, it's, yes, there the results are. So how game-changing is this solution? So we have the results before us. Uh, 8%, 9%, 33%. I think so it's visible to visible to everyone to see this and uh, and understand this. I think there is uh, quite attraction for this. Thank you so much. We have nearly 400 participants today and it's fantastic to have 400 participants in this action track and you're from all over the world, we are here. Can we have now, before we go on, we'll put up the third poll. Uh, can we have the third poll on the screen now, which is on, so I'll just speak it out. This is on the National Food Systems Assessment. How game-changing is this solution? Please rate it from uh, one to five. And uh, it'll be nice to have that. And now we will move ahead and we will come to this. So moving to the solution by Helena, who is the deputy, Helen, who's the deputy lead of Action Track 2 Workstream 1 on food environment and senior research fellow at Chatham House. Can we, uh, Helen, can you come in here and... And, and speak on this for us. Yeah, thanks everybody. It's great to be here. Thanks for joining us. Uh, just do, right, I think that should be yes. all good. Great, yeah. thank you. So I'm gonna give an overview of the food systems framework, which is a solution that a team of us from Chatham House proposed to facilitate cross assessment and national action plans up to 2030. So there's currently no comprehensive way to assess food systems at the national level. So we have the Paris Agreement, which includes greenhouse gas emissions from agricultural production within the country boundary. But this doesn't account for impacts of imported food. And it also doesn't connect food systems in a broader sense with climate biodiversity and public health goals. And it also doesn't assess the robustness of food systems in relation to future shocks. There's also a lack of speciality food systems departments or teams within government to adequately deal with these assessments and the required policy formulations. And there's potential resource constraints for some countries to actually be able to conduct such comprehensive assessments of the food system. And we know that the time frame for meeting the sustainable development goals is quickly narrowing and it's essential that countries are able to conduct comprehensive food system assessments and establish clear roadmaps up to 2030. So the, the food systems framework would develop standardized science-based food systems blueprint to provide a framework for country level assessment. And in addition to this baseline, it would also guide food systems development to align with the sustainable development goals by 2030. 
From the blueprint, national action plans for food systems would be developed that minimize environmental impacts, maximize public health benefits, and are resilient to future shocks. The national action plans would be regionally specific and formulated using a multi-stakeholder approach, including various perspectives. The national action plans would incorporate key criteria such as climate, biodiversity and public health goals and also provide to enable this to actually happen, national level um, teams across governments would be established to actually enable the joined up policy making that's necessary for this solution. The food systems framework would also establish a food systems fund that would essentially enable countries as and where needed the, the resources to actually develop and implement their national action plans. So there are various things that um, the, the Food Systems Summit could help with this. So first of all, member states could actually pledge their interests either at the summit or in advance of the summit and commit to the food systems framework. And we could also run a series of food system summit dialogues to assist this and convene a range of countries in that as well. So thanks so much for listening and uh, all of your questions, comments and suggestions are very welcome. So we'll be, uh, Helen, we, Helen, we'll be coming back to you, but I would right now invite uh, Keflewa to uh, respond to your presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Asia, again. Thank you, Helen, for such a very insightful presentation. Um, from the African Union perspective, we do encourage what is called the National Agriculture Investment Plans. So these investment plans are also multi-sectoral, uh, working with different sectors to actually promote investment in agriculture and also boost the consumption of indigenous foods within the AU member states. What we have done so far, we are also creating a platform to promote the African chefs for using traditional indigenous foods and to promote consumption of these forgotten African foods. We sometimes call them orphan foods, but we want to ensure that these foods are not uh, begotten. At the AU summit level, the heads of state have agreed that the year for this year should be, the theme should be around culture and heritage. And so far by bringing the food culture as well, and by ensuring that our indigenous food systems are also sustained and also to improve the policies that we have within the AU member states. So we want to also push for policies that are nutrition sensitive. Thank you so much. Can I ask you to respond to this, please? If uh, you'd want to, you know, put your comments here. Is that for me, AJ? Yes, that's for you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks so much for that. I think that's a really important aspect to bring in. And it's certainly an aspect that I think we could expand on within the food systems framework. So it would be great to work with you on that and the organizations that you're involved with on that. Um, and I think that would really help to strengthen that component. There is an aspect in there where we foresee the national, the food systems frameworks being developed um, with a range of different stakeholders, including indigenous and youth groups, for example. So I think that would certainly come in there really um, nicely to actually build that out and put a lot more detail and learn from the the experiences that you've had and the sort of frameworks that you've been working with to see how that might sort of scale up and be applicable across a range of different countries as well. Um, so one of the questions, uh, Helen, is uh, how, how do you view food banks as a way to achieve equitable food distribution? Yeah, I mean, I think it's an interesting one. Obviously, we're currently in a system where food banks are essential for some. I would personally like to see a system where we didn't actually need food banks because everyone had um, fair access to nutritional, healthy and sustainable food. 
But I think in the current system, obviously, uh, food banks are increasingly important, which I think is also quite a worrying sign um, that the system is certainly going in the wrong direction quite rapidly. Thank you. And this question is for you, Keplewa. Uh, uh, so this is, how does the changing implementation in African countries happen when governments are not supporting or empowering youth in agriculture production? This is specifically for you. Thank you so much for that question. Thank you for that. Uh, like I mentioned before, this is why the African Union uh, theme is now focusing on culture and heritage. And also we want to ensure that the youth doesn't forget the culture, doesn't forget the heritage where they come from. And from the NEPAD perspective, we do have a skills youth program whereby we actually work with different youth across the AU member states to support uh, you know, the uh, skills on youth. We do have uh, a funding from different organizations and donors that support us to ensure that the youth are not left behind. And then at advocacy and policy level, we do work with these uh, uh, private sectors, the farmers organization, for example, to ensure that uh, agriculture is not left behind and to ensure that our youth is not left behind as well. We are currently supporting Nigeria as one example. They are actually uh, organizing uh, the independent um, dialogue focusing on the youth and AUD and NEPAD is providing support to this youth uh, platform in Nigeria to ensure that even within the food system summit, the youth are not left behind. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think uh, we will move on and uh, we, will, we will go on to uh, the next, uh, next part of the program. And I would request people to keep putting in their questions in the Q&A. We are trying to answer all of them and some of them we are trying to take, take, take it out live. Now, the results of poll three, can we have the results of poll three? Wow, there, there they are. How game-changing is the solution rate on a scale from one to five, and the answers are before us. 39% of people are saying at four, and 8% are saying at one. I think <clears throat> this is uh, very clear of what we are looking at here. Thank you so much for this, uh, for this uh, solution. I think we'll move on, and we will put on the, on, on, on the screen now the, the poll number four, which is the last poll. And uh, yes, we have poll number four, which is food is uh, never waste. And how game-changing is this solution from one to five? And one being not game-changing and five being very game-changing. So looking to your ideas on this, we're trying to collect ideas. Please give us your ideas. And the 364 participants at the moment, it's, it's, it's very encouraging and we hope to get answers so we know what to do. We look to your ideas to form our ideas. Thank you so much. And I will move on now on this. And I will request Richard uh, Swanell to a member of the Workstream 3 on food waste and also the International Engagement Director at WRAP. Richard, you have two minutes to uh, explain this. Uh, thank you very much, AJ. And thank you very much thank for the opportunity you. to speak to you today. Um, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the opportunity to actually reduce food loss and waste. Approximately a third of food is lost or wasted globally, and that's responsible for about 8 to 10 percent of global greenhouse gas emissions. Now, to put that into perspective, if food loss and waste was a country, it would be the third biggest emitter of greenhouse gas emissions on the planet. So an absolutely enormous uh, uh, impact on the environment. So what can we do and what's this game changer about? Well, this game change has been developed to bring together proven policy interventions with new technology to ensure that no food is lost or wasted, no food goes to landfill, no food goes to incineration. So this is about driving a less wasteful and more circular food system across the world. So key components of this are mandatory segregation of food waste by businesses and households. And this is that gives that makes sure that we're all aware of the scale of the challenge. People don't see the food waste and don't realize how much there is, they can't act. And it's worth saying that recent research by UNEP has shown that household food waste is not only a problem for the rich world, but it's a, a problem right around the world. Um, and it's roughly the same uh, amount um, uh, per capita, wherever, virtually wherever you are in the world. 
Second is incentives for food donation to get to the food to those in need. We understand the food system isn't working perfectly at the moment and, uh, and incentivizing food donation, at least at the moment, is a good thing to do. Mandatory measurement of food waste by businesses. This means that they can quantify the amount and indeed the opportunity for food, so, well, food waste savings. And therefore that drives them to tackle food waste. And that's been the experience in a number of countries around the world. But also to prevent that food waste and food loss and waste actually going to unproductive, in fact, damaging um, solutions like landfill or incineration, taxing or banning um, landfill and and, uh, of incineration of food waste and food loss and waste just to make sure it goes back productively into the economy and incentivizing the use of food loss and waste as a feedstock for added value products. And there are a number of ones here, some that have already come up in the chat, such as black soldier fly larvae that focus on taking uh, food loss and waste and actually turning it into a safe uh, fish or chicken food and, and, and acting as a soil conditioner. But there are other opportunities where food has gone back into the food system um, and actually created interesting products such as Marmite and Vegemite, uh, which, are, which are actually developed from brewers' grains, from the waste products from brewing. So we think by combining all this, we can make a big difference to reducing food loss and make sure that food is never waste. Thank you, AJ. I think you're on mute, AJ. So thank you, Richard, for that. Uh, I will, we will come back to you, please stay on. We will now first request Yon to come in with, uh, Yon, can you please come in? Yes. Well, thank you so much, um, Ajay and Richard. Uh, in many ways, um, the main work that we are doing with indigenous peoples, the issue of food waste uh, is, not, uh, is not a major issue because as you know, indigenous peoples, many indigenous communities actually among their values, they cannot accumulate food. Very often food is shared with neighbors, is given within the community, is, what, is part of the circular economy that indigenous peoples practice. And very often uh, it is not even possible to uh, store it uh, and it needs to be served and given away. I think, the, I think we, we must reduce uh, food waste. It's outrageous that we are generating foods that end up as garbage. So we have two problems, all the waste and the environmental impact during the production of that food in terms of water use, in terms of uh, resources, inputs, uh, agrochemicals or organic inputs, but then also dealing with all of this as garbage in, in the cities and in different places is unacceptable and, and is really nonsense. If an alien will come to Mother Earth and see what we are doing with food, they will think we are completely crazy. But let me say it also that I think we need to talk about the elephant in the room. I think the big elephant in the room is that prices as of today, they are unable to show the real environmental impact of food transport and food production. The price of food does not reflect the environmental impact that is creating in humankind. And this results in cross subsidies of food that is being funded by taxes and by taxpayers elsewhere in terms of all kinds of environmental, uh, environmental policies that are trying to address some of these impacts. We believe uh, in, the, in the global hub on indigenous people's food systems that mixing up food generation with food production and putting in the same bag all food systems as food production systems is a mistake. And the lack of an approach that it is sensitive to the level of anthropocentrism and biocentrism is actually a mistake. When we fish and we go into the ocean and we catch thousands of fish that end up dead again in the ocean because they have no market value, it's again nonsense. And it's because we are taking a food generation system and we are filtering to a way of anthropocentric food production that is treating it like any other intensive system that we have to generate food and produce food across the world. These are nonsense. Labels are going to label and food labeling is going to change very rapidly with the urbanization of the population. When 70% of humans will live in the cities, uh, labeling of foods will change. And probably that will give us with technology uh, an opportunity to actually trace back how the food is being generated or produced and incorporate a number of indicators that are essential for us and that I would like to see included in this game changer. Things on how much displacement of people have the production of this food generating, how much environmental impact has the production of this food uh, created. 
how many kilometers or miles has this food traveled to our tables? And all of these, in a way, are is fundamental if we are to create a new system of values, because food waste is not the real problem. The real problem is the waste of our values, that we accumulate things and food is just yet another example of this way of living that is based on accumulation and that is nonsense. Thank you so much. You all, thank you so much. That was really powerful. Thank you so much. We'll uh, ask uh, Emily to come in before we come back to Richard. Uh, Emily, the floor is yours. Okay, great. Thank you so much. And, and thanks, Jan, for those comments as well. I'm, I'm quite fired up now. Um, so, you know, so having read through and, and reviewed the, and discussed this among colleagues, I really, I feel like the solution has a lot of promise, but one of the gaps that I saw or one of the things that really needs to be considered are the realities of developing countries if we want to make it a real food systems game changer in low and middle income contexts. Uh, first of all, infrastructure for collection and processing of waste can be limited and often comes with a price tag attached that de-incentivizes both businesses and households from using proper waste disposal practices. Most governments in, in the global south don't have the fiscal space to invest significantly in expanding this type of infrastructure that would make it more widely available and accessible. So this would need to be heavily subsidized likely by external funding sources. Additionally, across a number of these contexts, Enforcement of regulations is highly inconsistent, this for a variety of reasons, uh, but this does need to be taken into account when considering adoption of regulatory re requirements that have been laid out here. Uh, finally, and I think the most importantly, when we're considering implementation in low, in in low and middle income com contexts, making sure that we have tangible, practical applications for both preventing and utilizing food waste is essential. The applications and processing and preservation technologies need to be simple, readily available, and relatively low cost. To prevent and reduce food waste, we need to find ways of prolonging shelf life and product saleability and maintain food safety and quality. This could include, for example, investment in cold chain technologies that utilize solar power and prolong the life of fresh fruits and vegetables. Uh, for processing and utilization of the remaining food waste, we need to look towards generation of value added products that there is or will potentially be a market for and that those generating the waste can easily utilize and or access these disposal systems. This is really critical so that both businesses and individuals within these contexts are incentivized to participate in and promote the solutions. Essentially, they become the champions. Um, so also when these processing with these processing and utilization solutions, the more we can help create income opportunities for women and youth the more we are likely to see strong uptake in communities, as well as overall sustainability of this proposed solution. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. I'll Before we move on to the questions, I'll come back to Richard to respond. And then there are lots of questions coming in. Please be ready for the questions that are coming in. And I, as a moderator myself, have a question. So sure. let's, let's move in. Thank you, AJ. And thank you very much for that excellent feedback. Jan, I agree. It's nonsense. That's why this is a career area we've got to do. It's nonsense that we're throwing away so much food and valuing, why aren't we valuing waste? Sorry, why aren't we valuing food and not wasting it in the first place? I totally agree. One of the really interesting observations that's been found in other countries around the world is that when you ask people, are you wasting food? They nearly always say, no, we're not. Businesses, you ask businesses, food business, they'll say, no, we're not wasting food, we're a food business, we don't waste food. And so then I said, well, okay, what happens if you measure that? What happens if you segregate out just for one week uh, the amount of food that you're throwing away every week and just see how much that is? And every time the people say, oh, crikey, there's a, there's a heck of a lot of food waste there. That happens in the home. It happens in businesses. And it's quite a, a low cost way of encouraging people to see the, the scale of the challenge and therefore thinking, good grief, there's, there's, I can save money here. I can make better use of the food. So a lot of the game changer is actually focused on trying to trying to get people to see the consequences of their existing behavior that they're currently not seeing. And that's important, I think. And that fits with you, Emily, as well. 
how do we, one of the key things of this game changer is it's all really about prevention. And then only the stuff that we can't prevent, we need to get back into the economy. And that I completely agree with you. The technology across the supply chain, solar, solar cool chain, it's exactly the sort of technology we envisage as being part of the technology solutions. And also where there is uh, surplus food arising that can't be uh, shared with people, can we turn it into added value products? I mentioned the insect protein one, I mentioned Marmite, I mentioned, and, and actually we've also seen this with composting and anaerobic digestion technology, where compost is grown and actually then used to grow more vegetables that then go back into supermarkets or into stores. I think that's exactly the concept we're looking for here. And, and that can be many, many small actors in small countries um, and, and in countries that, which have less infrastructure that they can adopt some of these lower tech solutions, whereas in other countries, maybe there are higher tech solutions. But I think this whole concept of getting into this idea that we're having a circular low waste, I'd say zero waste economy is where we've got to go to. And I think that's applicable, but we need to find really creative ways of doing it in low income countries. I totally agree. Uh, thank you, Richard. I'll take, uh, I'll, I'll direct the first question to Yon. Uh, Yon, this is for you. And this is from Patricia. She's from Africa. And she says that food waste in Africa is difficult to curb. And she goes on to say that investment into food production with innovative technology might be the solution, but investments into food processing plants in indigenous communities in Africa is just not happening. How do you find solutions to this? It's a very complex question because the whole debate about who is indigenous in Africa is a very intimate uh, discussion that um, African people, uh, indigenous and not indigenous need to resolve. So I will hesitate to, to talk to not being an African about Africa. Certainly what we see is that uh, indigenous people's food systems, they've been generating food for thousands of years, for hundreds of years, without having these issues, without having the issue of food waste. Actually in the research that we are doing, when we come across indigenous peoples and we try to tell them, are you wasting food? They don't understand the question because nothing is waste. These are inputs that are feeding the cattle, they are feeding the animals, they are, uh, they are uh, composting. A major issue uh, that probably could complement uh, this uh, important game changer um, is that we need to stop treating uh, kitchen waste that has been uncooked, that is raw as, as waste, as garbage. I think that creates some kind of distortion in our head that does not make us realize that food is sacred. The loss of values uh, that we see uh, across different societies with respect to, to food uh, in many ways reflects with the fact that we are wasting food without realizing. But I think companies do have a major role here to play unless they come out with circular distributions, unless, the, their, the, unless their distribution channels are both ways and not only to sell, but also to deal with some of the garbage and some of the externalities that the companies are creating, the, this game changer will not be completed. And that needs to be incorporated there. And another very essential role is chefs. We modified what we eat constantly. Our food tastes and habits are not constant. They have changed across uh, centuries. And this is very important here, the role of uh, not only spend, expanding the food base, but very importantly, things that we consider as, uh, as waste today, they, are, uh, they can be delicious foods if they are cooked and they are treated. So this is what I have learned from indigenous peoples. I'm not saying anything that I have not learned from them. Now, why, the question I will throw it back to you, Ajay, why are we not practicing this? Richard, why are we not doing this? Why the companies don't have both size distribution channels. They only sell us products, but they don't take the garbage. They don't uh, take back some of the bottles that are empty. We throw them, we recycle them again with a tremendous investment of uh, energy. So there's a lot that can be done along the chain by all of us if we are serious about eliminating food waste. Johan, thank you for that. I'll, <clears throat> my perspective as a farmer is when I deal with agriculture input companies is that you need very strong regulation and very strong mm -hmm. enforcement of that regulation. And that comes with governance in the states and which we find missing in lots of low medium income uh, countries. And that's what I think a problem. I mean, that's what would be my answer why, why companies are not working voluntarily and regulation. Both of them have to go together. And I'll come to you, Richard, with the next question, which is, uh, a comment from Hillary Howe, 
And the question is that regarding food is never waste, point one, mandatory segregation should be supported by hefty penalties if not done. And Philippines has a law for it, exactly like Yon is saying, but it's poorly executed. You know, what can you do about it? It's, I, it's, it's a regulation, it's, it's a governance problem. You know, we elect such leaders and they just don't follow up on our aspirations. Yeah, that's a really good question. And because actually this is done very well, for example, in South Korea, they've got a great example of, uh, of, of separating out and it works extremely well. But the, the barriers, working out exactly how to get this to fit into an, each culture is key. And I think it, be, it builds on what Jorn said about valuing food. And I think we've now got the research that shows that food waste in the home is a global problem. And we now need to tackle it. And once you show people what's actually happening within homes, they're much more open to the segregation agenda and indeed the prevention messages. So whether, whether it's hefty fines or whether it's actually leading by example, I think is key. But I also, building on what Jan said, I also think the role of business is absolutely key. Uh, the role of business in innovation, in extending, uh, that Emily already mentioned, extending uh, shelf life, that's an absolute key part of Alice. Creating more circular solutions in packaging is a key part of this, but, business, but businesses need to be committed to this agenda and indeed be part of the discussion with citizens in their home to help them reduce food waste and indeed to help them deal when they're looking at the uh, material, coming up with sensible ways of actually uh, collecting um, uh, uh, materials that can then go into compost and AD. But perhaps, Emily, getting around, you know, my, my dream is that any, any surplus food that's thrown away has a value and therefore people will collect it because it's valuable. It has a value. Converting it, for example, into chicken feed or fish feed means that there might even be a small, uh, you know, you might get a small rebate by actually segregating out your food waste. That type of thinking, if we, rather than sort of saying it's got to be banning, it's can we think of incentives that move? Now, just to give you an example of businesses acting, we've seen uh, businesses in South Africa have already committed to halving food waste by 2030. We've just launched a public-private partnership with um, Global Food Banking Network and um, um, BAMEX in Mexico with the major retailers in Mexico to get them. They've committed to halving food waste by 2030. You know, and in the UK, we've seen examples where, as a result of the commitment of businesses and citizens, food waste has come down by 27% in 10 years. So it is possible to do it. But the key thing is, got to come back to the point I made earlier, at the moment, people don't think they waste food. Businesses don't think they waste food. And that if we can get, we've got to get over that in order for then, and that's one of the things this game changer is trying to do is to make it absolutely clear. You can see it absolutely clear. And then people start thinking, what can we do about it? Uh, thank you. Um, there's another, another question on this. Uh, this is for Kefli Wa. Um, are you there? Okay. If it was there, yes. Agriculture is not a mandatory curriculum in schools. The extension outreach to farmers has dwindled and the vocational training is not readily available. What is the AU doing to ensure knowledge and skills in agriculture and entrepreneurship are translated into practices? Thank you so much, AJ, and thank you for the question again. I think this is quite interesting. Uh, like I mentioned before, uh, within the African Union Development Agency, we do have programs that are targeting uh, youth, and we have the training, vocational training program that we work with the farmers across the region in Africa. We have eight regions. We do also have our, our, our you know, um, units in within Ethiopia, whereby they work with social affairs, department where we ensure that we cascade all these programs to the youth and give some funding, for example, a seed money for the youth to start some of these programs. So we do have uh, support from the donors. We appreciate that. And some partners that we work with, including the UN, that we work together, like FAO, for example, have been funding a, a beautiful youth program uh, through AUD and NEPAD, whereby we engage with the youth and ensure that they are, the skills of Africans are actually improved. And we continue to do so. Thank you for that. I can't hear you. Sorry, I get muted. So uh, this question is for Lasse. Uh, the question is consumers in de developed countries are convinced they need an animal-based diet to be healthy. Public awareness will only go so far to change that. How can governments send signals that will quickly and substantially change consumption? 
I just want to add a point that I see in the developing world also happening, that as we progress, we are changing from plant-based diets to more and more animal proteins. So the problems that the developed world is facing today, we are bound to face in, in 10 to 20 years from now. So what do we do about it? How do you change that? Well, thanks for that question. Uh, it's a really important question. You know, uh, often, often uh, while the the term leapfrog has been used, but I think that often some kind of uh, can be used in a condescending form. It has been used in a condescending form when it comes to development and climate change issues. I think the important part is to to look at the reality of of uh, low income countries and emerging economies, and to look what are the needs. Uh, that are faced there, what are the realities and what are the cultures that are based there, and then accommodate that, as opposed to now what we're seeing is that the so-called solution that has been the predominant agriculture model in the global north, particularly around intensification and working against nature as opposed to with nature, um, has there's an attempt to try to export that to the global south, which unfortunately is not the best idea. So I would say the best, the best thing is to, again, look at what are the needs and the realities of low-income countries and how can we address those nutrition needs and to ensure there's um, food production that meets that based on uh, food safety, food security, and importantly, food sovereignty issues. And to do that, a shift towards more regenerative agriculture and or agroecology is crucial. Thank you. So this is, this is for Ketliva. Could you kindly elaborate on territorial approaches uh, like uh, like you and Habitat and and Florence Eagle? Can you can you do that? This is a question. That's yes. Coming. Yes. Thank you so much. In fact, we have a project that we are working with uh, through the um, French Embassy. Uh, for example, in Botswana, we are supporting the government of Botswana to ensure that. In rural, uh, in like districts, for example, there is fair chance of uh, food security and of course leveraging with the food systems approaches and working with the local government people to ensure that even in rural areas and peri-urban areas that also, uh, in, you know, form part of the whole food systems uh, dialogues and form part of the government support in terms of uh, giving incentives to uh, farmers, including also the vulnerable household. So it's something that we are also doing in terms of boosting research for territorial uh, um, um, uh, segments or, or settlements. Thank you for that. Thank you, thank you so much. So I'll take this question from uh, Zervas, Future of Food Institute, and I'll just open it to all the panelists here, whoever would want to take this. Why do we have a perception of true pricing making food products much higher? I've heard that price per product would change no more than a small percentage. Would somebody want to take this uh, question? I, I can. I can. And then, yeah. Adrian, then hand over to uh, to Jan because I'm sure that he's closer to this than me. Um, but I, you know, when you start thinking in terms of the environmental degradation, and Emily mentioned this in her response as well: water, carbon, soil degradation, biodiversity loss. Um, the food system is one of the biggest uh, has the, one of the biggest impacts on the entire planet. Jan mentioned bycatch um you know you when you start thinking about that right across the supply chain and remember food loss and waste alone is eight to ten percent of greenhouse gas emissions uh, when you think of the whole food system we're talking so estimates around 30 percent uh, of total greenhouse gas emissions um if you start contact you're know, looking at the costs of the impact of that on global warming then i think you suddenly get some fairly big figures so i'm not sure that if you truly costed in all the cost of the external artists there would be quite a big impact but i don't know what others think Any, uh, Jan, would you want to uh, add to that or we can move on? I think when we go to the market and you find two apples, one to each other, there's two things that happen. Normally the local one, that it can be uglier, it can has a different organoleptic appearance. Uh, for some reason, it's more expensive than the perfect round apple perfectly red that has come from 3000 kilometers away. And this is strange and it's hard for many of us to understand it. So we have come up with a system that the local ugly organic apple that we picked up from the neighbor's tree 
can be more expensive than an apple that has come from across the world. So there's a lot of thought that we need to do together on this. I want to say something, Ajay, if you allow me, if I may, about the territorial question before uh, that please, it was. Please do. Yeah, because one of the reasons why we do believe in the global hub of indigenous people's food systems, that indigenous people's food systems should be considered a game changer in itself, is because it is a food system that is intimately related to the territory and that manages the territory in a way that adapts the food generation or food production to the ecosystem characteristics of that environment. And this is something that it is not done. Uh, when we chop down the forest to plant uh, monocultures of maize, or when we cut down the, the Amazon to grow cattle, we have the technology to do that. But I am not sure that that is the most effective and adapted food generation or food production system to that specific ecosystem. And that is creating, again, huge externalities. Indigenous peoples don't do that. I don't imagine indigenous peoples in Mongolia planting uh, tomatoes, the same thing that I've never seen the Inuit when they go hunting, I've never seen them growing lettuces. They have a food system that is absolutely based on territorial management and that we have a lot to learn if we are to come up with sustainable and resilient food systems. And many of the food waste issues will be uh, dealt by if we come back to the territory. Uh, thank you, Yon. I just want to add one question as a moderator that what I, uh, first of all, to this question of farmers are becoming dependent on nutrition to markets, you know, unlike growing themselves. So I think so this is, this is, a, this is also a factor which adds to the problem. But my question to the group, and if anybody wants to uh, reflect on this question or any of the points that have come in before we close the session is, why as a farmer do I find that more and more research is happening for increasing production, which, which leads to inevitably is leading to industrial agriculture rather than investments happening to reduce food waste, which will automatically increase the availability of food available. Would anybody want to take that question? And if anybody wants to add in, because these are the last uh, comments, if anybody wants to come in with short answers, please. Hey, Joe, I'll have a first crack at that. I mean, I think it's fascinating because I think what's happened is the food system has got used to a level of waste that we're now blind to. And I do think that actually, you're dead right, what we should be doing rather than saying, let's increase production. Um, you know, let's actually, first of all, drive out food loss and waste across the supply chain. That should be the priority. And that should be the priority in terms of having a better food system It's a priority to, to feed the world. It's particularly as it's getting more and more urbanized, we need to find ways of encouraging people to value food again as part of that particular process, as Jan has already effectively said. But I do think it's fundamental. Why are we expanding production when we're wasting this amount of food? Sure, if we need to have more production once we've eliminated food loss and waste, great. But let's do that bit first. Thank you so much. And uh, can we have the results of the poll now? Can we have the results of the poll? So uh, here are the results and uh, most people agree with uh, with the game changing solution, which is which is very good, and this is nice to have this poll. It's there, available for everyone to see, and I think uh, this has been a great uh, great uh, session where lots and lots of questions, lots and lots of questions have been answered, and that's been really good. And I thank all the participants. I thank all the team which is working to answer questions. I thank all the people who joined in from across across the across the planet to give us solutions please stay tuned with us i will now call upon our founder and executive chair of eat and chair and and chair of action track to gunhail to give us your closing remarks and a call to action for the months to come and thank you everyone it's been a real pleasure gunhail the floor is yours Thank you so much, Ajay, for excellent moderation and to the speakers and panelists for uh, great interventions, uh, but most importantly, thanks to all of you. Uh, I must say that if I just uh, dial into this uh, discussion without knowing what it was, I couldn't tell whether this was an expert consultation or whether this was an open forum uh, with uh, with the public. So so this has been really rich. 
uh, a rich discussion, or perhaps we should say a rich cooking session, because what you are doing uh, now is really helping us shaping the the solutions menu and I think being able to test the water, getting your uh, constructive and critical feedback uh, ideas and inputs is really important. And uh, I think this is also a much needed reality check for, uh, for us as we move towards the pre-summit in July and then the summit in September, because we know by now that we are running out of time. Uh, we need to, um, raised ambition level and we need to make sure that we are actually at the right place and given your feedback today i think we can conclude that uh, there's good things in here but we still have more work to do so uh, we will call up on you again uh, you will be invited uh, to contribute uh, again we will get back to the dates uh, so I just want to, to say thank you again, and uh, remember, fixing food is something that will require uh, all of us to contribute, and I think this is a fa fantastic example on how we can move the needle together. So thanks again, have a wonderful day, and please reach out uh, to us via the community platform uh, and the submission um, for the online uh, survey where you can submit ideas will be open until May 1st. So uh, wish you a wonderful evening, wonderful day. Thanks uh, to all of you. Bye bye.